This 8 hours refresher course is designed to comply with OSHA's hazardous waste and emergency response annual training requirements. This course material is copyrighted by Remtech engineers and may not be reproduced. Lessons learned on over 8,000 incident responses during the past 40 years will be shared that will hopefully enhance your ability to minimize liabilities and costs associated with hazardous material incidents. Some of the issues that contribute to increased costs and liabilities are 1. Lack of incident frequencies and practice that makes response efforts difficult. Emergencies frequently occur when three or more unusual circumstances occur simultaneously that are difficult to anticipate and subsequently difficult to respond to. 2. Fear of reporting incidents due to job security or disciplinary action concerns. 3. Moving the source around that spreads the contamination and increases exposures. 4. Trying to solve problems without a proper support team. 5. Lost time due to not having a spill response deployment plan with predefined containment and remediation points and worst-case toxic corridor projections. And 6. Inadequate loss prevention practices. This course is designed for personnel involved with the investigation and remediation of uncontrolled hazardous waste sites and to response to an accident involving hazardous materials. It provides basic information needed to meet the requirements of 29 CFR 1910.120 E3I, Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response. Fifteen modules will be covered in this training that consists of a review of HAZ Whopper Hazard Identification, Properties, Management, Personal Protection, Site Control, Environmental Monitoring, Medical Monitoring, Response Resources and Labeling, and Control Methods. Management of hazardous wastes, substances and materials are regulated by a variety of regulations, including the Toxic Substances Control Act, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Department of Transportation, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act, Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, and National Priorities List, NPL. Training requirements range from 8 hours to over 40 hours, depending on the roles and responsibilities of responding individuals. This course will emphasize emergency operations related to hazardous substances, materials, and wastes that are independent of location. Some of you may have responsibilities with characterization and disposal of hazardous waste that will also be covered. Facilities that respond to hazardous material releases are required to have an emergency response plan with training that includes planning and prevention, hazard recognition, site security and control, PPE and emergency response equipment, response team and emergency medical treatment and first aid. Working in pairs is critical to the safety and success of any hazardous response operation. Each individual looks out for the welfare of the other. Response teams should be within line of sight with one individual observing, while others are performing a task during containment, cleanup, decontamination, or emergency response operations. One person should be responsible for communicating back to the field leader of progress and any problems encountered. The goal of decontamination is to remove contamination from individuals or equipment and to confine contamination to the exclusion zone. Emergency response should only be conducted by those individuals appropriately trained to perform a defensive or active function. The first responder's role is to discover and report a release to initiate a response and notify appropriate regulatory officials immediately upon discovery. Regulatory authorities frequently interpret immediately to be within 15 minutes. The HAZMAT response team is responsible for handling and controlling a release to stabilize or prevent further spread of contamination. A hazardous substance is defined as any material that may cause an adverse health effect and includes hazardous substances defined by CERCLA or the DOT and toxic substance defined by TOSCA or biologic agent. The hazardous waste is defined as a waste or combination of wastes as defined in 40 CFR 261.3 or 49 CFR 171.8. 40 CFR 261.3 includes waste that are Hazardous by characteristic defined as Ignitable, corrosive, reactive, EP leachate toxic, toxic depicted by U, acutely toxic depicted by P, listed by a specific waste composition, or a specific waste generating source. Once a waste is listed as other than by characteristic, it cannot be treated to be non-toxic, but maintains its original designation and must be disposed as a hazardous waste.
immediately dangerous to life or health concentrations, IDLH, pose an immediate potentially irreversible threat to life safety, with a maximum escape time of 30 minutes. When no IDLH is specified, 10% of the LEL or acute animal respiratory irritation data, RD50s may be used. When less than 19.5% oxygen is present, a respirator cannot be used as supplementary oxygen is required by a supplied air respirator or SCBA. For instance, the oxygen concentration in Mile High Denver is 17% that in many cases results in altitude sickness or less tolerance to alcohol consumption until an individual becomes acclimated. Technically, respirators are inadequate for this and other locations, as the oxygen density in the atmosphere decreases with altitude. Permissible exposure levels, PELS, are enforceable by OSHA and became effective on July 1, 1993. Recommended exposure levels, RELS, are suggested limits that are frequently lower than OSHA PELS and published by NIOSH, a CGIH or in the biological exposure indices. The TWA concentration must not be exceeded during any 8-hour work shift of a 40-hour workweek. TWA is calculated by summing the product of the concentration times the exposure time at each exposure interval divided by 8. Individual concentrations for a period may exceed a period TWA as long as the average over an 8-hours day is less than the regulatory TWA and less than the ceiling value and IDLH value. Using benzene as an example, the TWA equals 0.1 ppm, for first hours 0.11 ppm, second through seventh hours 0.05 ppm, eighth hours 0.2 ppm. TWA equals 0.11 times 1 plus 0.05 times 6 plus 0.2 times 1, divided by 8, which equals 0.076 ppm. However benzene is a carcinogen so there is no safe level. The STEL or short-term excursion limit is the concentration of a substance that cannot be exceeded during a 15-minute period. From a practical standpoint, a ceiling limit should be considered the maximum concentration an individual may be exposed to or not be exceeded at any time. This is because peak exposure limits are not readily available in most emergency response references, such as NIOSH, DOT, Cameo, or Wiser. There is no safe concentration for a designated carcinogen displayed as CA in references. AEGL1, AEGL2, AEGL3 represent noxious and non-reversible health effects and lethal concentrations to general public in toxic corridor projections respectively. Refresher Topic 2 covers training requirements. Emergency response awareness level training only requires a sufficient initial training to discover and notify authorities plus an annual 8-hour refresher. 24-hour has whopper training is limited to situations with known chemicals and concentrations less than IDLH and does not include cleanup operations. First responder operations that take defensive response measures to stop a release are required to have 8 hours of initial training plus an 8-hour annual refresher. Hazardous materials technicians who take aggressive response measures must have 24 hours of initial training plus an 8-hour annual refresher. Incident commanders are required to have the same level of training as the hazmat technician to direct and control an incident. Treatment and disposal facilities with new employees are required to have the same level of training as hazmat technicians. Current or existing employees at treatment and disposal facilities can have either have equivalent experience or 24 hours of initial training plus an 8-hour annual refresher. Workers at hazardous waste sites are required to have more extensive training than other workers. The work experience for workers and supervising managers are summarized on this slide. 40-hour has whopper training covers situations with unknown chemicals and concentrations greater than IDLH and also includes cleanup operations. Refresher Topic 3 covers identification, management, and properties of hazardous materials and substances. When characterizing and managing hazards it is important to know where you are, what the hazards are, and what are the pathways for potential exposure to various receptors, people, property, animals, and the environment. The hazard location can work in conjunction with the hazard source that can be biological, chemical, physical, or mechanical, electrical, fire, thermal, or radiation and may occur in combination. Note that hazardous material incidents frequently occur with the simultaneous occurrence of three or more improbable events. The first step is to identify and quantify the hazard source. The hazard location can have an amplification or attenuation effect. 
For instance, a chemical release located in a confined space or basement can allow vapors to accumulate, resulting in higher exposure potentials. Spills or releases on a mountaintop with the wind blowing can disperse vapors and allow liquids to flow away from receptors on high ground. Releases on railroad tracks pose an obvious additional safety hazard. Pathways that lead to exposure can be through the air, water, soil, direct contact by ingestion or injection. Releases can travel through storm sewers, runoff into waterways, soil, groundwater, or eating food that bioaccumulates or translocates contaminants. The weather can influence the rate and duration of exposures and the time available to complete a remedial measure. Hazards can be controlled by a variety of methods starting with the source, stopping the release, slowing it down, or diverting the release away from a pathway. The pathway can be controlled by implementing engineering controls that cut off or eliminate the pathway. The final control measure may be to remove or minimize the exposure to the receptor by sheltering in place or removing it from the pathway. Hazards are dynamic in nature. Hazard characterization and management needs to be performed on a continuous basis until the hazard has been mitigated. Being familiar with the hazards and locations at each site, pathways, and surrounding receptors and pre-planning response measures are the best way to minimize adverse impacts to public health and the environment. Location hazards that can contribute to the overall hazard associated with hazardous material incidents include Topography, industrial setting and associated activities, transportation mode, indoor or outside locations, drainage features, incidents that occur on land, water or in air, surrounding utilities, and confined spaces. Maximum potential exposures may occur in areas where there is minimal air ventilation, such as in confined spaces or depressed areas. Confined spaces include tanks, sewers, manholes, basements, caves, tunnels, and pits. Depressed areas include ditches, excavations, trenches and crawl spaces. Liquids and vapors can be transported underground by storm sewers. Knowing where manholes and storm sewer outcrops can be helpful in identifying spill isolation or recovery points. Dense vapors have a tendency to migrate to streams, ditches, and lakes, since they are lower than the surrounding terrain. Recirculated air in airplanes and tight buildings can cause gas concentrations to build up increasing exposures. During shelter-in-place situations, HVAC systems are generally turned off to minimize exposures. Atmospheric conditions that can impact contaminate exposures include microclimatic conditions that occur in densely populated urban areas with thermal islands that increase the evaporation of volatile chemicals, updrafts and downdrafts of wind around high-rise buildings impacting dispersion, inversion conditions that trap concentrations close to the ground, and open or rural areas may allow for increased dispersion of contaminates reducing exposures. Workers need to be aware of overhead and underground utilities. Overhead power lines may cause shock hazards for equipment booms, lifts, cranes, or even dump trucks. Call before you dig can prevent impacting gas lines, fiber optic cables, water lines, and other underground utilities. Elevated surfaces can cause potential fall hazards and require fall protection. When wearing personal protective equipment, vision, smell, sense of temperature, and reflexes are masked preventing the body's natural warning properties from functioning properly. As the level of PPE is increased, mobility, dexterity, and productivity decrease exponentially. In level A PPE, fogging of mask lenses and a sense of claustrophobia sets in making it difficult to accurately evaluate or respond to hazards. As protective levels increase, the level of perceived confinement also increases, triggering a desire to get out of gear for individuals that are not trained. The most frequent work site injuries occur from tripping, falling, and struck by accidents. Uneven, unstable, or ground cover can hide tripping or falling hazards. Working around viscous and slippery products can cause slipping hazards. When working around equipment with high-pressure hydraulic lines or cables under tension, it is important to stay a safe distance away from potential failure areas. Other hazards are summarized on this slide. Air transport is one of the most rapid means of exposure to hazardous vapors or particulates. The chemical source strength, wind direction, meteorological stability class, and temperature dictate a particular toxic corridor that impacts public safety and potential evacuation or shelter-in-place decisions. A standing order for working on spill cleanups. If you do not get in it you do not have to get out of it. So do not touch, step in, or approach a release from a downwind location if possible. Contaminates can travel through storm sewers, ditches, creeks, or streams. 
Knowing the location of these pathways relative to releases can indicate potential protection, containment or recovery locations. Secondary exposure pathways include migrations of contaminants from the soil into groundwater that may eventually enter our drinking water system. Vegetables or fish can translocate or bioaccumulate contaminants may enter our body through ingestion. PCBs are bioaccumulated up to 48,000 times in shrimp or other bottom-dwelling organisms. This is a principal reason a large number of individuals have PCBs in their body. The weather can have a significant impact on the rate of transmission, a hazardous material travels through a pathway, and the time available to implement hazard management. Wind speed and direction affects the shape and size of a toxic corridor projection. Rain can attenuate a hazardous vapor or cause a liquid or solid release to cover a larger area. Diverting clean stormwater around a contaminated source can be an effective management tool to control the size or footprint of a release. Snow or ice combined with freezing conditions can hide or immobilize a liquid if temperatures are below a contaminant's freezing point. Lightning or elevated temperature can introduce a potential ignition source or increase the evaporation of a volatile chemical. Constantly monitoring current and forecasted weather conditions over time is a crucial part of hazard management. Protections of receptors are generally ranked people first, property second, and animals last. Protection of site workers, company workers and off-site populations should be considered simultaneously. Managing on-site evacuations is much easier than surrounding populations. In high-density areas, shelter-in-place is a much safer option, while turning heating and ventilation systems off due to time and safety constraints associated with contacting and conducting evacuations. Protection of downgradient-sensitive receptors that include nursing homes, schools, daycare centers, playgrounds, and hospitals need to be a priority. Other receptors include downstream water intakes, water wells, and human food crops and animals. Regulatory authorities require that parks recreational areas, aquatic and other habitats be protected from releases. This includes marinas, fisheries, and nature centers. Contaminants can migrate through or around underground utilities including sewers, water or gas lines. Contaminates can also migrate through polyvinyl chloride underground water lines. Physical safety hazards must be considered as part of any hazardous material response and site safety plan. Physical hazards may be the cause of a release or introduce compounding issues to be considered or managed to ensure a safe response operation. The most prominent source of injuries on hazardous waste sites and emergency response are slipping, tripping and being struck by incidents. Selecting the appropriate protective equipment to adequately protect workers while at the same time not adversely impacting the ability to safely complete response tasks is of vital importance. Potential electrical hazards occur when dealing with releases around electrical power sources. Protective measures include turning power off with lockouts and keeping elevated equipment 10 feet away from overhead power lines. Call before you dig is important to avoid damage or hazards associated with underground utilities. Explosion-proof equipment should be used where flammable materials are present. Ignition sources should be at least 25 feet away from flammables. Ground fault interrupters on handheld tools and equipment and watertight corrosion-resistant cables should be utilized to avoid shock hazards. Appropriate electric, battery, combustion engine, compressed gas, or hand tools and carts need to be selected that are compatible with the material and site location. Thermal hazards include heat stress that can result when wearing protective clothing. Major disorders that can occur are heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat stress can be avoided by keeping hydrated, controlling work shifts, allowing rest periods, and wearing cooling vests. Cold temperatures can also cause medical problems. The severe effects are frostbite and hypothermia. To prevent cold exposure, wear appropriate clothing, schedule rest periods, monitor physical conditions of workers, and remove wet clothing immediately. Other safety hazards include excavation, engulfed, lighting, and radiation. Shoring is required when excavation depths exceed 3 or 4 feet. Working in tanks with products like grain or sand can cover or smother individuals that make rescue difficult or impossible. Adequate lighting is required while working. OSHA sets out minimum illumination requirements in the HAZ Whopper standard, 1926.65 M. The site safety officer should ensure that illumination meets the requirements of the standard. Minimum illumination required in excavations, sites, and maintenance areas is 3-foot candles. 5-foot candles are required in general site access, tunnels, and underground work areas. 
Mechanical hazards include working around equipment where pinch points, being struck by, or pressurized releases can occur. Keep hands and personnel out of the range of failing pressurized hydraulic lines or tension cables, and operating mechanical systems should be part of every safety plan. Elevated noise levels can interfere with communications or cause hearing damage. Whenever possible, equipment should be kept out of direct contact with contaminants and away from workers on the ground to avoid potential injuries. Atmospheric hazardous conditions can be avoided by not working in adverse weather or an oxygen deficient, less than 19.5%, or excessive oxygen environments, greater than 25%. This slide presents noise levels from various equipment and work environments. Workers exposed to noise sometimes complain of nervousness, sleeplessness, and fatigue which can reduce job performance and may cause high rates of absenteeism. Excessive exposure to noise can cause temporary or permanent hearing loss. It can also cause tinnitus, ringing in ears, and more physiologic reactions, such as a rise in blood pressure or a faster heart rate. Wear hearing protection, such as earplugs or muffs or both. Generally, if you need to raise your voice to be heard, you should wear hearing protection. Excessive noise can also interfere with communications. Sound level measurements or noise dosimetry must be performed to show that noise exposure levels are below the action levels. Implement engineering administrative controls if noise levels exceed OSHA's permissible noise levels. Controls include Installing sound dampening materials or mufflers, erecting acoustical enclosures and barriers, increasing the distance between employees and noise sources, rotating employees who are operating noisy machines, and keeping windows and doors closed when noisy equipment is nearby. While the OSHA PEL is 8 hours at 90 decibels, dB, noise levels above 85 decibels are considered dangerous by most organizations. To determine the hazards associated with a chemical, the appropriate chemical name or synonym is required to consult a reference. Proper chemical names, rather than trade names, are required. When mixtures of chemicals are present, the component that is the most toxic may be selected to define a response strategy. Chemicals with good warning properties such as odor thresholds provide useful information associated with selecting appropriate protective gear. Chemicals with odor thresholds that are less than PELS can help in deciding when respiratory equipment is required or when it is inadequate. WISE is a good reference for obtaining odor thresholds. Simple field tests can be used by experienced environmental engineers and scientists to classify unknowns. Ignitability, solubility in water, pH, specific gravity, water reactivity jar tests can be conducted away from the source to define rudimentary hazards. pH defines a liquid as a potential acid or base, an ignition test can provide a ballpark estimate on the flash point and amount of thermal energy required for ignition. Compounds that react with water are water reactive. When dealing with acids, bases, or water reactives, it is always safer to add the stronger chemical to the weaker. For example, adding sulfuric acid to water is safer than adding water to sulfuric acid. When a chemical leaves a container, it changes when it interacts with the environment. For example, when a small quantity of gasoline is mixed with water below its solubility limits, the resulting solution is not flammable. Gasoline vapors are heavier than air, and when you are in a stream and upstream from a pool of gasoline and the wind is at your back, your exposure to a potential fire is minimal. The specific gravity or vapor density determines where a liquid or gas will accumulate. For densities less than 1, vapors and liquids accumulate at the top or at higher elevations. If the ambient temperature is above an auto-ignition temperature, then the risk of fire is imminent. Ignitability and flammability are defined for liquids that have a flash point less than 140 F as determined by the Pensky-Martin closed cup method. Ignitability for solids is defined as persistent burning in RCRA. Selecting protective gear, spill response equipment and supplies, decontamination agents, and tools that are compatible with the material you are handling is critical. Section 10 of Safety Data Sheets presents material incompatibilities that should be avoided. Materials that sublimate, i.e. pass directly from the solid to vapor phase include dry ice, mercury, and naphthalene. Lithium, sodium, cesium, lithium aluminum hydride, and calcium hydride are examples of water reactive substances that react exothermally with water. The ionization potential IP, of a chemical, to be detected by a photoionization detector PID, must be less than or equal to the energy generated by the UV lamp. For example, a PID with a 10.6 electron volt lamp 
will detect chemicals with IPs less than 10.6. Each manufacturer generally provides a chart with a correction factor that is applied to the meter reading to calculate a concentration for a specific chemical. The melting point is the temperature at which a solid changes to a liquid. The freezing point is the temperature at which a liquid or gas freezes. For example when TDI is pumped into a MDI tank at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the TDI freezes since it is below its freezing point. Operating air diaphragm pumps with compressors without drying systems in freezing conditions will cause condensate to freeze in the airlines and stall the pump. Viscosity is defined as a material's resistance to deformation. A product's of viscosity impacts mobility and pumpability for recovery operations. Increasing the temperature decreases viscosity. For materials with viscosities greater than molasses, vacuum truck extraction may be necessary. Lower viscosity chemicals can be transferred with diaphragm or centrifugal pumps. The vapor pressure of a volatile chemical can cause an empty drum to bulge as depicted above. Volatile chemicals frequently require venting devices to prevent excessive pressure buildup. Chemical hazards are indicated by container placarding and labeling. Exposure potential is associated with the physical state of the material. Hazardous gases or vapors may be the most rapidly transported by wind velocities. Solid particulates or fugitive dust may also be transported by wind that can cause inhalation hazards or dust explosions. Liquids or larger sized solids generally require direct contact. If a chemical has good warning properties, i.e., a threshold odor concentration that is less than a permissible exposure limit or irritation property, then odors can assist in selecting personal protective gear or contaminant breakthroughs into protective gear or respiratory protection equipment. Are there published safe limits for the hazardous material that can be measured, i.e., PELS, TWAs, RELS or other data that can be used to monitor safe working conditions? A dilute chemical is generally less hazardous than a concentrated form. Explosive, reactive, or flammable materials should be prioritized as they pose an immediate and higher hazard than other materials. Reactive chemicals can pose hazards to human health, such as chemical substances that detonate from shock, heat, or friction. Explosions are rapid reactions that release thermal energy, shock waves, and heat. Chemical incompatibility or the interaction of two or more reactive materials results in uncontrollable and undesirable reactions. A chemical reaction can result in chemical changes due to incompatibility. Water reactive materials are capable of producing toxic vapors. Categories of radiation are alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Alpha particles cannot penetrate matter very far and can be stopped by a piece of paper or stay in the lungs once inhaled. Beta particles can be stopped by a thin piece of metal or plastic. Gamma radiation can penetrate through several centimeters of lead. Protection from gamma radiation can be by controlled exposure periods or by can be reduced according to the inverse square law as radiation strength is reduced as distances are increased from the source. Oxidizing reactions are usually violent exothermic, heat-releasing, chemical reactions and can be the most dangerous. A separate source of heat is required to maintain endothermic chemical reactions. Removing the heat source stops the reaction. Examples of oxidizers include halogens, chlorine, fluorine, peroxides, hydrogen peroxide, benzyl peroxide, ozone, strong acids, and hypochlorites. The corrosiveness of acids and bases can be compared based on their ability to dissociate or form ions in solution. Those that form the greatest number of hydrogen ions are the strongest acids, while those that form the most hydroxide ions are the strongest bases. Corrosive bases with pH values approaching 14 pose more of a hazard than chemicals with a neutral or pH of 7. Corrosive acids with pH values approaching 1 are more hazardous than neutral materials. Toxicity may be affected by the concentration of the material present and time of exposure. Acutely toxic chemicals that target critical body organs should be prioritized. An example of acutely toxic materials are agents that attack the central nervous system. Chronic toxic exposures include cancer-causing agents that have no safe concentration. Fire and explosion hazards can occur from chemical reactions, shock-sensitive materials, explosives, unstable compounds, incompatible compounds, and when optimal fire and tetrahedron conditions exist. Pressurized flammable materials are frequently in containers with rounded ends. Unstable compounds include hydrazine, styrene, acrylic acid, acrylonitrile, greater than 30% hydrogen peroxide, and pyrophoric compounds.
materials that can be readily ignited and sustain a fire are considered flammable or combustible. Three components are required. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. The concentrations of fuel and oxygen must be high enough to allow ignition and to maintain the burning process. Combustion is a chemical reaction that requires heat to proceed. Most fires can be extinguished by removing one of the three components. The most dangerous fire hazards have a low ignition energy, low lower explosion limit, wide flammable range, and combustible dusts. The ignition temperature is the minimum temperature that a liquid gives off sufficient vapor to ignite in the presence of ignition source. The fire point is the temperature that combustion occurs continuously. The auto-ignition temperature is when a material will spontaneously combust in the absence of an ignition source. Fire and explosion conditions can be managed by removing one leg of the fire triangle. To remove oxygen and inert gas may be used such as nitrogen. To have a fire you need the optimal fuel-to-air ratio. If there is too little fuel a lean condition exists. With too much fuel, a richer displaced oxygen condition exists. The easiest approach is to remove the heat or ignition source. The lower explosive limit or lower flammability limit is defined as the lowest concentration, by percentage, of a gas or vapor in air that is capable of producing a flash of fire in presence of an ignition source. The upper flammable limit or upper explosive limit is defined as the highest concentration, by percentage, of a gas or vapor in air that is capable of producing a flash of fire in presence of an ignition source. For example benzene has a LEL of 1.2% or 12,000 ppm. When an alarm of an explosimeter goes off at 10%, the concentration of benzene in air is 1,200 ppm. Generally speaking, materials with a flash point less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit are considered flammable. The National Fire Protection Agency, Department of Transportation, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act all have specific definitions for flammable, combustible and ignitable materials. These definitions are depicted on this slide. The fourth leg of the fire triangle forms the fire tetrahedron. This leg depicts the chain reaction of a fuel to continually produce flammable vapors from the fire's heat of combustion to maintain fire. While oxygen is the usual oxidizing agent during the combustion process, there are chemicals that can burn without oxygen being present. For example, calcium and aluminum will burn in nitrogen. The fourth leg of the tetrahedron includes the fourth element that depicts a chain reaction or uninhibited chemical reaction that allows fire to occur. Reactive chemicals can pose hazards to human health, such as chemical substances that detonate from shock, heat, or friction. Explosions are rapid reactions that release thermal energy, shock waves, and heat. A reactive material is one that undergoes a chemical reaction under certain specified conditions. Generally, the term reactive hazard is used to refer to a substance that undergoes a violent or abnormal reaction in the presence of either water or normal ambient atmospheric conditions. There are three primary categories of radiation that include alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Alpha particles are simply energetic helium ions. Because of their large size, compared to other forms of radiation, and their high charge, they cannot penetrate matter very far, and can be stopped by a piece of paper or stay in the lungs once inhaled. Beta particles can penetrate through more material than alpha particles, but generally can be stopped by a thin piece of metal or plastic. Gamma radiation is simply high-energy electromagnetic radiation, and is the most penetrating of the three radiation types. Gamma radiation can penetrate through several centimeters of lead. Protection from gamma radiation can be by controlled exposure periods or can be reduced by the inverse square law that indicates that radiation intensity is reduced by the inverse of the square of the distance from the source. Water reactive materials are capable of producing toxic vapors. Chemical incompatibility or the interaction of two or more reactive materials results in uncontrollable and undesirable reactions. A chemical reaction can result in chemical changes due to incompatibility. Oxidizing reactions are usually violent exothermic, heat-releasing, chemical reactions and can be the most dangerous. A separate source of heat is required to maintain endothermic chemical reactions. Removing the heat source stops the reaction. Examples of oxidizers include halogens, chlorine, fluorine, peroxides, hydrogen peroxide, benzyl peroxide, ozone, strong acids, and hypochlorites. Hazards of oxidizers includes destruction of metals and organics, ignition of combustible materials, shock-sensitive organic peroxides, and the evolution of oxygen. 
This slide presents a partial list of explosive and shock-sensitive materials. Some of the more common explosives and shock-sensitive materials are ammonium nitrate, nitroglycerin, organic peroxides, and picric acid. Corrosive hazards include the electrochemical degradation of metals or alloys, or the destruction of body tissues by exposure to concentrated acids or bases. The corrosiveness of acids and bases can be compared based on their ability to dissociate or form ions in solution. Those that form the greatest number of hydrogen ions are the strongest acids, while those that form the most hydroxide ions are the strongest bases. The pH scale is used to measure the concentration of an acid or base. The hydrogen ion concentration in solution is called pH. The pH reading represents the relative number of hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions in solution. Strong acids have a low pH, many H plus in solution, while strong bases have a high pH, few H plus in solution, or many OH minus in solution. The pH scale ranges from 0 to 14. The concentration of ions increases by a factor of 10, with each whole number change in pH. Measurements of pH are valuable because they can be quickly done on-site, providing immediate information on the corrosive hazard. Toxicology literally means the study of poisons. Toxicology is the study of the interaction between chemical agents and biological systems. It is known that a given amount of a substance can produce certain harmful effects. When assessing toxicity information, it is important to understand two different concepts, dose-response relationship and adverse effects. In general, these indicate how much of a toxic agent is necessary to elicit a predetermined type and intensity of a response in an experimental population. The dose-response relationship is a fundamental concept in toxicology and the basis for measuring the relative harmfulness of a chemical. Lethality is the end point and is the easiest to observe. Lethal dose 50 LD50 is the dose that will kill 50% of the population. This is an attempt to identify the average toxicity of a substance for organisms of a particular species. Acute effects are usually caused by short-term, acute, exposures, generally less than 24 hours. Acute health effects may disappear soon after the exposure ends or the damage may be permanent. Chronic health effects occur many months or years after exposure and are often the result of long-term, often low-level, exposure to a chemical. With some chemicals, chronic health effects can result from short-term exposures. Chemicals can enter the body via four routes. Breathing, inhalation, absorption through the skin, swallowing, ingestion, and injection. Of the four routes, the lungs generally offer the least resistance to a chemical entry. The vapors, particles, and fibers you inhale end up in the lungs and, in some cases, cross into the bloodstream along with oxygen. The smaller particles and fibers are the deeper into the lungs they are likely to travel. Skin adsorption can also be a major route of exposure. Many chemicals for example, solvents and liquid insecticides, can cross through intact skin into the bloodstream. The rate absorption varies with skin thickness, water content, and fat content. Some chemicals will pass through skin more quickly if skin has been exposed to water for an extended period of time, for example, wearing sweaty gloves all day. The rate of absorption will also increase if the skin has been irritated, damaged, punctured, or been exposed to chemicals that break down fat. Chemicals can be ingested or swallowed when you eat, drink, or smoke. Toxic particles are also ingested when you swallow the mucus that has trapped them. Do not eat, drink, smoke, or put on cosmetics in a contaminated area. Chemicals, bacteria, and other materials can be injected under your skin by contaminated tools, sharp objects, or pressurized air, gas, or hydraulic fluids. Typical body responses to chemical or physical hazards are indicated on this slide. Factors that affect an individual's response to a toxic chemical include body weight, occupation, physical and health condition, past or present exposure to other chemicals, gender, females are frequently more sensitive, heredity, age, and lifestyle, smoking, nutritional status. Impacts to lungs can be manifested through congestion, wheezing, or shortness of breath. Nose and throat impacts can result in sneezing or sore throat. Head or central nervous system symptoms include dizziness, headaches, stress, or tremors. Eye symptoms can result in irritation or redness. Ringing or hearing loss can be from noise impacts. Skin exposures can result in redness, dryness or itching. 
asphyxiants are chemicals that interfere with getting oxygen to body tissues and can cause suffocation. Simple asphyxiants take the place of, displace, oxygen in the air so that there is less oxygen available. Carbon dioxide, ethane, helium, hydrogen, methane, neon, krypton, acetylene, nitrous oxide, argon, propane, and nitrogen are examples of simple asphyxiants. An atmosphere with less than 19.5% oxygen by volume is considered oxygen deficient and immediately dangerous to life and health. Adverse health effects, such as reduced reaction times, may begin at 19.0% oxygen. Chemical asphyxiants reduce your body's ability to provide oxygen to tissues, even when there is plenty of oxygen in the air. Chemical asphyxiants interfere with oxygen getting into the blood, oxygen being transported to body tissues, oxygen being taken up by tissues, or a combination all three. Carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, and methylene chloride are examples of chemical asphyxiants. An irritant causes inflammation by direct contact with the skin, eyes, nose, mouth, or respiratory system. Irritants can also be allergens. Respiratory tract irritants can cause injury to the nose, mouth, throat, and lungs. Inhaled irritants can harm any part of the respiratory tract, but their water solubility determines where they will do the most damage. Materials that are more water-soluble, e.g., ammonia, formaldehyde, and sulfur dioxide, affect mainly the upper respiratory tract, as they contact moist tissues in the nose and throat. Less water-soluble materials, e.g., nitrogen dioxide and phosgene, act deeper in the lungs, lower respiratory tract. Chlorine and ozone are examples of chemicals that often affect both the upper and lower respiratory tract. Skin irritants can cause redness, itching and drying of the skin, which is known as contact dermatitis. Organic solvents and detergents are examples of skin irritants. Some acids, such as sulfuric acid, are irritants at low concentrations, but can cause burns and destroy tissue at higher concentrations. Allergic sensitizers generally affect the skin and respiratory tract, and the reaction may get worse with each exposure. Sensitizers include isocyanates, formaldehydes, phenol resins, epoxy resins, chromium, and nickel. Systemic toxins effect affects the entire body or many organs, rather than a specific site. This is different from local health effects, such as skin irritation or burns from contact with an acid, which occur at the point of contact with the chemical. An example of systemic toxicity is the central nervous system, brain, depression caused by exposure to alcohols. Like many chemicals, alcohols can also cause local health effects such as irritation at the site of contact, skin, eyes, and lungs. Blood system toxins damage blood cells or interfere with blood cell formation. Examples include benzene, methylene chloride, arsine, phosphorus, and naphthalene. Nervous system, neuro, toxins damage the central nervous system, brain. Symptoms include dullness, muscle tremor, restlessness, convulsions, loss of memory, epilepsy, and loss of muscle coordination. Examples include mercury, insecticides, hexachlorophene, and lead. Liver, hepato, toxins cause liver damage and produce symptoms including jaundice and liver enlargement. Examples include alcohols, carbon tetrachloride, and nitrosamines. Kidney, renal or nephro, toxins damage the kidneys. Examples include halogenated hydrocarbons, heavy metals, ethylene glycol. Reproductive toxins damage the reproductive cells, egg and sperm, or interfere with their formation. Examples include lead, cadmium, salicylates, and vinyl chloride. Carcinogens cause cancer and must be listed on an SDS with a concentration equal to or greater than 0.1%. Cancer can take 20 to 30 years after the exposure to develop. Carcinogens include asbestos, methylene chloride, toluene, and 2,4-diisocyanate. Teratogens cause birth defects in the developing fetus. Examples include thalidomide, anesthetic gases, methyl ethyl ketone, xylene, methylene chloride, lead, methyl mercury, cigarette smoke, ionizing radiation. Many teratogens can affect the fetus even before the woman knows she is pregnant. Mutagens cause a change, mutation, in your genetic material. Mutation of reproductive cells may cause birth defects in children. Mutation of other cells in the body may cause cancer. Examples of mutagens include ethylene oxide, a sterilizing chemical used in hospitals, benzene, hydrazine, and ionizing radiation. Many mutagens are also carcinogens. Biological hazards may be present in the area that the response is occurring in or may be the hazard itself. 
Biological hazards are classified as viral, bacterial, organisms, fungi, plants and animals. Some biological hazards are only present in certain locations. Poisonous plants, snakes, or insects need to be considered. Some wastes are pathogenic due to their source such as hospital wastes, red bag wastes, or municipal sludges that are a hepatitis threat. When releases occur offsite, containment or recovery locations can be in an area where there is poison oak, poison ivy, or unknown pathogens that have been improperly disposed of such as sanitary waste or diseased animals with rabies. Responding in pandemic areas or with contaminants such as anthrax, legionnaire disease, or salmonella can also pose hazards to response individuals that require additional PPE protection and vaccinations. Bloodborne pathogens are a specific type of biological hazard. Microorganisms that cause diseases are generally referred to as pathogens. They are generally classified into four main groups, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Viruses are extremely small infectious agents that are basically packages of genetic material. They can reproduce only within cells of living hosts by taking over and forcing the host cells to reproduce the virus. Some examples of illnesses they cause include AIDS, caused by HIV, hepatitis B, a variety of colds and flus, and herpes. Bacteria are one-celled living organisms that do not require a living host cell to reproduce. E. coli and salmonella are a couple of examples that cause intestinal diseases, tuberculosis and gonorrhea are other examples. Fungi. Fungi include yeasts and molds. They are single or multi-celled plants that live by decomposing and absorbing the organic material in which they grow. They can cause diseases such as athlete's foot, ring worm, and farmer's lung, and also cause asthma and allergies. Parasites are single or multi-celled plants or animals that live upon, or within, other living organisms, hosts, from which they obtain some advantage, like nutrients. Some examples include giardia, beaver fever, malaria, and trichinosis. Trichinosis is caused by eating raw or undercooked pork and wild game products infected with the larvae of the trichinella worm. The first step in preventing disease is to keep the organism from entering the body. There are three primary routes of entry. Inhalation, a pathogen is usually carried on respiratory droplets in the air and enters the respiratory system. For example, colds, flu, and tuberculosis are transmitted when an infected person coughs or sneezes and spreads the microorganism through the air to others. Ingestion, the pathogen is ingested, usually via contaminated hand or food. For example, in foodborne outbreaks of hepatitis A, the virus is shed in the feces of an infected restaurant worker who doesn't wash his or her hands properly after going to the bathroom and then spreads the virus by handling or preparing uncooked foods or foods after cooking. Bloodborne contact, prevent pathogen from entering the bloodstream. Bloodborne pathogens are microorganisms that are present in blood or other potentially infectious materials, OPIM, and can cause disease. Blood includes human blood, human blood components, products made from human blood, and also medications derived from blood, e.g., immune globulins, albumin, etc. Some examples of BBPS are presented on this slide. The main bloodborne pathogens of concern are hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, which causes acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. Occupational exposure means reasonably anticipated skin, eye, mucous membrane, or parenteral contact with blood or OPIM that may result while an employee is doing his or her job duties. Reasonably anticipated contact means potential contact as well as actual contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials. An exposure incident is a specific contact with blood or OPIM that is capable of transmitting a bloodborne disease. Parenteral or percutaneous contact means contact through a piercing of the skin, such as by needle sticks, cuts, or abrasions. The risk of occupational exposure to BBPS can be reduced or prevented by these methods listed on this slide, following universal precautions. Using safer medical devices and equipment. Following proper and safe workplace policies, practices, and procedures. Using appropriate PPE when contact with blood or OPIM is expected. Maintaining a clean workplace. Making sure all contaminated materials are properly labeled. 
The Unified Command Structure is a universally applied response organization used by regulatory authorities and fire departments. Understanding and operating under this organizational structure will help operations run smoother. The first to respond to the incident is usually the incident commander that may be relieved when a more experienced individual or the fire department hazmat team or regulatory authority arrives on scene. The incident commander, I see, has the overall responsibility to manage and direct all response personnel and operations, while ensuring the protection of the health and safety of both on-site personnel and the general public. The incident commander determines incident goals and objectives, establishes command, the command post, initial staging area, develops the incident command structure and assignments, ensures development and approval of the incident action plan, authorizes release of information, and ensures development of adequate safety measures. The incident commander may assign a public information and liaison officer. The public information officer is responsible for developing and releasing information about the incident to the press and public after command approval. Obtains media information that may be useful to incident planning. Keeps media from interfering with response activities. The liaison officer establishes community information systems and provides information updates for the incident, is the primary focal point and contact for agency representatives for coordination and information exchange. Keeps the incident commander informed of status, capabilities and limitations of resources of the cooperating and assisting agencies. Ensures information on cooperating and assisting agencies is incorporated into the incident action plan. A field manager supervises a field response team and site safety officer. Rescue, deacon, and command supervisor functions can be combined with the field manager or site safety officer duties on smaller incidents. The field manager provides advice to incident commander when analyzing strategies. Uses all available information to plan and execute the incident tactics. Supervises all tactical resources. Orders resources required to accomplish the incident objectives. Site safety officer responsibilities are to ensure all aspects of the incident are managed in compliance with safety rules and guidelines, identifies hazardous and dangerous situations associated with the incident, works closely with the field manager, provides specific safety input to the incident action plan and health and safety plan. Special technical advisors can be brought in to assist on more complex responses that require specific specialties depending on the hazards present. The regulatory minimum is four trained people, but the practical minimum is six people. No person should ever take direction from more than one individual, and no individual should be responsible for more than five people. This is called the span of control. Entry personal and deacon personal work in pairs. Response efforts are always dependent on weather conditions when they occur outside. Continuous monitoring of current and forecasted weather conditions frequently defines the time available to complete a response or special measures to prevent the release from spreading. Within the command structure the fire department is responsible for perimeter and off-site support. The police generally perform evacuations or shelter-in-place notifications. Initial on-site rescue and recon generally occurs during the first 5 to 30 minutes. Regulatory reporting to the state and national response center and regional EPA is required immediately and is frequently interpreted to be within 15 minutes of discovery by regulatory authorities. Fire department and ambulance response is generally within 5 minutes, fire hazmat within 30 minutes, and response contractors within 30 minutes to 120 minutes. Ambulances may require deacon verification prior to transport. Life-saving measures may be required within 10 minutes for heart attacks, strokes or unconscious individuals. A site safety plan is the heart of any response effort. Plans are frequently dynamic as information from recon teams provide updated information and as response measures are implemented. Some of the control options are presented on this slide. To develop a site safety plan, a hazard evaluation needs to be conducted and hazard risk management strategy has to be selected. Hazard evaluation identifies the location, hazards, pathways, and potential receptors. Management options include source, pathway, and receptor controls. The risk management strategy selected optimizes stopping and or reducing the source strength, determination of safe distances, attenuation, stopping or redirecting the source pathway, and removing or protecting the receptor. For fixed facilities, worst-case scenarios need to be pre-planned. Site safety plans should be prepared for each response and updated as the incident progresses. 
At a minimum, safety plans should be revised at the beginning and end of each shift or as the scope of work changes or an incident occurs. The elements that should be filled out on this form are presented in the next couple of slides. The site safety plan should indicate the topography, emergency contacts and direction to the designated hospital and site hazards present. Safety data sheets should be attached to the plan for each hazardous chemical. The associated PELS, IDLHs, LEL or UEL, and other physical chemical hazards need to be recorded. Weather conditions need to be monitored and updated as conditions change. Consideration needs to be given to where and the type of site security that is required. Available utilities determines if additional utilities are required such as electrical or water. Communications to be used need to be identified and verified. Hazard controls and training of workers for each hazard needs to be confirmed. Work zones need to be defined, clearly marked, and enforced to prevent spreading of contamination. The type of PPE for each work zone needs to be specified along with the associated decon procedures. The compatibility of equipment with the hazard needs to be determined to avoid introducing adverse reactions. Monitoring instrumentation must be identified and available on site, along with calibration equipment to document the integrity and efficacy of response operations. Spill containment equipment and supplies need to be available on site that are appropriate for hazard properties. Spill cleanup residues need to be disposed of as required by federal and state laws. The site safety plan needs to be signed by all participants and updated as the scope of work changes or when incidents occur. The permit required confined space, PRCS, is a confined space that has one or more of the following hazards, 1, contains or has known potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere, 2, contains a material with potential for engulfment, 3, has an internal configuration such that an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or a floor which slopes downward and may taper to a smaller cross section, or, 4, contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazard, e.g., rotating machinery, electrical hazards. Confined space entry permits must be prepared each time a confined space is entered and approved prior to entry. Baseline conditions and lockouts should be confirmed first followed by engineering controls to ventilate or control hazardous conditions and minimize PPE required. Whenever possible, time in a confined space should be minimized or remote remedial measures used to avoid entering confined spaces. One individual needs to monitor the entry team from outside the confined space. Selected applicable parameters need to be recorded on the permit. Permits need to be reissued for each activity day. Individuals need to be trained and sign the permit. Permit entry elements are presented in these two slides. Section 5 covers site emergencies. Site emergencies require an evacuation plan with exit, assembly, and shelter-in-place areas that posted so all employees are aware of exit routes that are routinely practiced. An emergency operations center as well as an alternate center should be posted on the map. Emergency procedures for handling medical or chemical emergencies are outlined in the DOT Emergency Response Guide, the Global Harmonized Classification and Labeling System, and on safety data sheets. This slide illustrates a site emergency operations flowchart. The site safety manager is responsible for assessing and ensuring that injuries or casualties are handled in a safe and proper manner. The deacon manager is responsible for decontaminating exposed personnel. The incident commander is responsible for ensuring that off-site personnel are properly protected from toxic vapors by either sheltering in place or being evacuated. The field manager is responsible for containing and mitigating the hazard and replacing exhausted equipment. Incidents need to be properly documented with the safety plan revised as appropriate. Every facility needs an evacuation plan with evacuation routes and assembly areas designated with well-understood alarms and employee notification systems. Numbers of employees need to be accounted for at each location. Emergency communications can be done with hand signals, radios, cell phones, horns or sirens. The best method during response activities is to maintain line of sight with response teams. Hand signals for personnel wearing protective gear needs to be used. Line of sight must be maintained for hand signals. The hand signals on these two slides needs to be memorized and practiced to ensure the safety of response teams in the exclusion zone. Take time to review and learn these hand signals.
This slide illustrates the decision tree to handle accidents or injuries. If life-saving procedures are required a decision must be made if decon is required prior to emergency care. Follow-up medical surveillance and reporting requirements must be followed. Decon verification may be required prior to transporting personnel and ambulances. Section 6 covers personal protection equipment. Level A protective gear is to protect workers from the most severe exposure conditions, i.e., when safe concentrations are unknown or conditions are above IDLH levels. Level A is also mandatory when there exists a potential for splash, immersion, or skin contact with toxic materials. For level A protection, respiratory protection must be an SCBA or Supplied Air Respirator, SAR, with full face piece that operates in the pressure demand mode, with an auxiliary SCBA bottle attached. Level B protective gear is required when a high level of respiratory protection is necessary and when skin contact does not present a severe hazard and when the material has been identified and IDLH conditions may exist. For level B protection, respiratory protection must be an SCBA or Supplied Air Respirator, SAR, with full face piece that operates in the pressure demand mode with an auxiliary SCBA bottle attached. Level C protective gear is required when the chemicals have been identified, concentrations are appropriate and can be removed by respirators, i.e., below the IDLH and within the respiratory assigned protection factor. A full face respirator is recommended and when oxygen concentrations are greater than 19.5%. Level D protection requires safety glasses, work clothes, steel tube work shoes. Long sleeve shirts and pants are also required. This slide illustrates levels A, B, and C protective gear. Level A fire proximity suits are also depicted. This slide illustrates level B, when the air pack is worn outside the suit, level C with full face respirators used in a confined space tank cleaning, a supplied air respirator that is non-pressure demand, and a supplied air respirator that is pressure demand. Hard hats and goggles and face shields are required when handling corrosives. When the head is turned sideways, chemicals can spray the side of the face that is not covered by the face shield. This is one reason why a full face respirator provides better eye and face protection. Chemical clothing needs to be put on so that protective suit sleeves are outside gloves and boots, so that chemicals do not run down inside gloves or boots. Taping glove and boot seams can provide added protection. SCBAs can be worn outside or inside protective suits in levels A and B experienced users can don SCBAs by raising over the head with hands placed on the mounting bracket so shoulder straps are in place. Less experienced users can place one of the straps over a shoulder, then pull the second strap so that the second arm can be pulled through once the bottle is on the back. Masks are then put on tightening the face piece straps until a face seal is achieved. The breathing tube connected last with the air supply turned on. When using an air pack inside a protective suit, the suit is stepped into up to the waist. An assistant helps the worker put on the air pack. The final step is to have the assistant pull the rest of the suit over the head and arms and zip the suit up. Cameo provides personnel protective gear and respiratory protection recommendations. The Wiser application provides personal protective gear and respiratory protection recommendations. As the level of protective gear increases from D to A, the time to don, doff, and decon increases. In addition, dexterity and levels of confinement and claustrophobic feelings are increased that results in decreased productivity with increasing levels of protection. When wearing level D an individual is at 100% productivity, level A reduces productivity to approximately 30%. Productivity associated with the different protective levels are depicted in this slide. Respirator qualitative fit tests are conducted by placing both palms over the cartridges and breathing in. 
If the mask pulls in and stays against your face, after holding your breath for 10 seconds you have a proper fit. An irritant smoke can also be used to challenge a fit test by placing your head inside a plastic bag and moving head around while breathing heavily and reading the rainbow passage. If no irritation is experienced, then you have a proper fit. Face masks are available in neoprene, silicone, and other materials of construction. Pick a mask that is comfortable and is assigned to you and not shared with others. Quantitative tests are conducted with instrumentation to measure leakage. For this respirator, you want, we want a fit factor of 500. So our line is above 1,000. You see this moving in real time. That shows that the mask he has on fits well and it's, it's properly adjusted. He has a good fit. It's going to do what it's supposed to do. When selecting protective gear, be sure that it is compatible with materials being handled. Other maintenance and inspections requirements are listed on this slide. It is important to verify that PPE is used within the manufacturer's shelf life. This includes disposable clothing, cartridges, and SCBA bottles. PPE parts need to be inspected for cracks, tears, degradation, and that all parts are in place. SCBA or supplied air bottles need to be checked to ensure that they are fully charged and ready for use. The respirator air protection factor required for a specific chemical is calculated by multiplying the permissible exposure limit by 10. Different respirators have designated APFs assigned for full-face respirators with particulate and organic vapor cartridges. Supplied air full-face respirators have a protection factor of 50. The highest level of protection if afforded by a self-contained breathing apparatus with a protection factor of 10,000. The rated equipment protection factor has to be higher than the calculated APF for a particular chemical. Manufacturers can specify a maximum use concentration that is less than the IDLH and rated capacity are specified in 42 CFR 84. GME P100 cartridges are magenta and green in color and are rated for most organic compounds and dust except mercury, as illustrated on this slide. Mercury vapors require a special cartridge. Nose respirators need to be checked to make sure all parts are in place, functioning properly, and cleaned to ensure that the worker is protected. When respirators are cleaned inhalation and exhalation valves can fall out, fold over, become creased or cracked. These valves are fragile and thin and need to be in place and replaced if folded over or creased. Another common problem is cartridge gaskets falling out in storage or when cleaned. Straps and respirator masks need to be checked for cracking, degradation, and snaps are working properly. Masks should be taken apart periodically and cleaned to remove contamination that accumulates between respirator part connections. Full-face respirators need to have clear lenses that are free from scratches or abrasions that obstruct vision. Removable lens cover protectors are available to protect mask lenses. Mask straps can become brittle and need to be checked to ensure that proper tension can be maintained to ensure proper fit during use. Nose cup assembly valves and flapper exhalation valves need to be checked to ensure that they are in place and seated properly. All gaskets, O-rings, and speaking diaphragms on the mask inhalation parts train need to be checked. Cartridge gaskets in the cartridge adapter need to be kept in place and checked especially after cleaning. Masks should be taken apart periodically and cleaned to remove contamination that accumulates between respirator part connections. MSA Elite masks also work with SCBA and SARS without the twin cartridge adapter and with the proper hose and adapters. Conditions that prevent the use of respirators are listed on this slide and include oxygen concentrations less than 19.5% when IDLH concentrations exist, when unknown contaminants or concentrations are present, when concentrations exceed maximum use concentrations, when contamination has inadequate warning properties, when cartridges indicate end of service, and when high humidity conditions exist. Respirators cannot be used when workers have facial hair that interferes with respirator fit tests, the worker is claustrophobic or has respirator limiting pre-existing health conditions, or when vision is not corrected by respirator fitted glasses. Section 7 deals with site characterization. This slide illustrates site characterization observations and measurements that need to be recorded when working on a hazardous waste site. When dealing with site emergencies, off-site, perimeter, on-site surveys or recon should be conducted concurrently. Observations are made from a distance when conducting perimeter recon and includes 
Identifying distressed vegetation or visible hazardous conditions such as smoke plumes, heat waves, unusual sounds or bulging containers, and potential containment and recovery points. The purpose of perimeter or fence line recon is to separate site hazards from off-site hazards. Perimeter recon observations may document dead or distressed animals, unusual colors, sounds, odors, vapor clouds, or drainage. Initial on-site surveys are usually conducted in Level B protective equipment to select the proper protective gear. Measurements and observations include Using monitors to detect the hazard, locating the compromised source, source type, container, and location. Potential pathways and containment points for remedial action are also documented. Continuous monitoring of all on- and off-site conditions are required as information is updated, as meteorological conditions change, and as remedial measures progress. Physical observations include sight, smell, sound, touch, taste, and feelings. Binoculars can observe hazards at a distance. Infrared temperature guns can detect elevated temperatures from a distance. Photoionization detectors, PIDS, and flame ionization detectors, FIDS, are used to detect select organic vapors. Four gas meters are used to detect oxygen, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and lower explosive limits, especially for confined space entries. Noise is detected with noise dosimeters. Radiation detectors document radiation levels. Chemical and physical hazards are quantified by exposure limits, warning properties, visible and sensible observations, and sounds. The various exposure limits specified by OSHA and NIOSH and ACGIH are listed on this slide. You need to be familiar with all of the exposure definitions presented on this slide. Section 8 covers important elements associated with site control. Site control elements include a site map, site preparation, designated site work zones, working in pairs or using the buddy system, communications to be used, safe work practices, and identification and location of the nearest medical facility. Site control requires that contamination stays in the hot zone and is not tracked out into the clean zone. The shape and size of the zones depends on the chemical, source strength, and meteorological conditions. Personnel and equipment are decontaminated in the contamination reduction zone. Site security must be provided to ensure that no unauthorized or unprotected individual enter the contaminated area. Site entry should always be upwind from the contamination source whenever possible. Standing orders for site control include that individuals work in pairs, site security is provided and posted, training in the appropriate topics is verified, and smoking, ignition sources, and eating are only allowed outside the contamination control line in a designated area. Activities, responsibilities, and PPE requirements for each site control zone are presented on this slide. Section 9 covers decontamination. Each type of contamination requires different decontamination agents, but follows the same sequence of donning or doffing protective equipment. The objective of decontamination is to prevent the spread of contamination outside the hotter exclusion zone. Containerization and disposal of contaminated protective equipment or agents must be according to the regulatory approved disposal method. Decontamination agents for particulates may involve vacuuming gear with a high-efficiency particulate vacuum, followed by washing with a surfactant and subsequent water rinse. Rinsates need to be collected and disposed of properly. Each contaminant requires a specific decon protocol. This slide illustrates some of the removal and inactivation decon procedures. Typical mask decontamination consists of an alkanox surfactant scrubbing, followed by a 0.05% bleach disinfection followed by a water rinse. Decon check can be used to check hazmat decontamination. This system uses biodegradable cleaners and thickeners with an ultraviolet disclosing agent that shows areas where additional cleaning is required with bright colors. Note that this product does not work with all materials or biological warfare agents. This slide illustrates the minimum decon layout for levels A and B protective gear. Decon is set up in the contamination reduction zone frequently on plastic. The exit should be set up so that workers exit upwind. Equipment is dropped prior commencing personnel decontamination. A decon assistant is in the same level PPE or one level below the worker's PPE, depending on the contamination hazard. Contamination is removed and or deactivated by spraying and scrubbing with a decon solution that is rinsed off with water.
Next boot covers and outer gloves are removed. The decon assistant then either changes the SCBA tank out if the worker is to re-enter the hot zone or assists the worker with removal of boots, gloves, and outer garments. The final step is to assist with the SCBA removal, with the face mask removed last. This slide illustrates the minimum decon layout for level C protective gear. Decon is set up in the contamination reduction zone frequently on plastic. The exit should be set up so that workers exit upwind. Equipment is dropped prior commencing personnel decontamination. A decon assistant is in the same level PPE or one level below the worker's PPE, depending on the contamination hazard. Contamination is removed and or deactivated by spraying and scrubbing with a decon solution that is rinsed off with water. Next boot covers and outer gloves are removed. The decon assistant then either changes the chemical cartridges or canisters out if the worker is to re-enter the hot zone or assists the worker with removal of boots, gloves, and outer garments. The final step is to assist with respirator removal and removal of cartridges, followed by respirator decon. This slide depicts a typical decon layout for a blood-borne pathogen or virus pandemic cleanups. Decontamination of viruses and pathogens requires special training and procedures and includes OSHA 1910.1030 blood-borne pathogens and disease-causing organisms training that is covered in a separate Remtic training module. The minimum PPE for pathogens is level C protective gear, consisting of at least two levels of nitrile gloves, a full-face respirator with GME P100 cartridges, Tychem, 2000 Tyvek suit with an attached hood, boots, latex boot covers, with all seams taped. Decon is set up in the contamination reduction zone frequently on plastic outside. If decon is performed inside, ventilation needs to be set up to prevent buildup of chlorine vapors from the sodium hypochlorite. Outside decon should be set up so workers can exit upwind. Equipment is dropped prior commencing personnel decontamination. A decon assistant is in the same level PPE as the worker. Contamination is deactivated by spraying the worker with a decon solution, consisting of 1000 ppm sodium hypochlorite, for a contact time of 10 minutes, prior to proceeding to the next decon step. Next boot covers and outer gloves are removed and placed in a plastic bag. The assistant assists the worker with removing the Tyvek while leaving the mask on and places it in a sealed plastic bag. The mask is then removed by the assistant followed by removal of the inner gloves. The worker then washes his face and hands with soap and water and exits the decon area. The worker then cleans his hands with a hand sanitizer. The assistant wipes off the cartridges with a cloth saturated with clean water and removes them from the mask. The mask is then immersed and scrubbed in an alkanox solution followed by immersion in a 1000 ppm sodium hypochlorite solution for a contact time of 10 minutes. The final step is to immerse the mask in clean water, dry it off and reattach the cartridges. If the HEPA filter cartridges are wet, then replace with new cartridges. The worker dons new protective gear prior to re-entering the decon zone. Facilities are deep clean following contact with a confirmed COVID-19 employee or patient. To determine appropriate areas to be cleaned a contact trace needs to be conducted in consultation with local health officials. After a facility is closed it is normally ventilated for at least 24 hours prior to deep cleaning. Thorough cleaning is required before high-level disinfection because inorganic and organic materials that remain on surfaces interfere with the efficacy of disinfectants. Removal of foreign material from objects is normally accomplished using water with detergents or enzymatic products. Fugitive dust may be removed by HEPA vacuuming. Hard non-porous surfaces that are frequently touched are cleaned and disinfected with appropriate disinfectants and appropriate contact time compatible with each surface. Areas that are cleaned include tabletops, desks, hardback chairs, doorknobs, handles, light switches, phones, keyboards, touch screens, electronics, toilets, faucets, sinks, remote controls, and alarm keypads. For soft, porous surfaces such as carpeting, rugs, and drapes, visible contamination is cleaned with HEPA vacuums, carpet and upholstery cleaners. Curtains, clothing, towels, and linens are laundered using the warmest water possible, 194F, and then completely dried. OSHA permissible exposure limits for chlorine or other disinfectants are monitored prior to allowing cleaned areas to be reoccupied. Blood-borne pathogens are generally decontaminated with isopropyl alcohol, ethanol, sodium hypochlorite, hydrogen peroxide or other EPA-approved disinfectants. 
Section 10 covers air monitoring used for site characterization, personal protective gear selection, and personal and public health monitoring. Surveillance instrumentation are depicted on these two slides. Physical observations can be made from a distance with binoculars. Vapors can be detected with an organic vapor analyzer, flame ionization detector, or photoionization detector. pH meters are used to detect acids or bases. Four gas meters are used for confined space entry and detect oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and the lower explosive limits of flammable or combustible materials. Note that it is important to use separate instruments when measuring high and low concentrations. When an instrument is used to measure elevated concentrations, it can tend to overread low concentrations as it may retain a memory of the higher concentrations that it was used for. This is especially important when taking measurements that are used to indicate when the hazard has been eliminated. When measuring the lower explosive limit, concentrations are expressed as a percentage of the lower explosive limit. 1% equals 10,000 ppm. Any deflection on a combustible gas meter indicates a very high gas concentration. Additional field instrumentation includes specific gas detectors for ammonia, chlorine, and other meters that are available in passive or pump modes. A sound meter can be used to detect noise levels in decibels. Safe levels of noise are generally less than 85 decibels or expressed in decibels. Jerome or Lumex meters are used to monitor mercury vapor concentrations in air. The Geiger counter can be used to detect radiation levels. Background ambient radiation levels are generally 0.01 to 0.03 millirunjun per hour or millirum per hour expressed as MR per hour. When radiation levels exceed 2 MR per hour a health physicist should be called in and the site should be evacuated. Samples can be sent to a laboratory for EPA-approved analytical results. Medical monitoring for heart rate, temperature, and scales to measure weight and percent fluid loss are used to prevent heat exhaustion. pH paper is a rapid way to determine if a material is an acid or base liquid. A more accurate pH measurement can be obtained by using a pH meter that has been calibrated against at least two or three standards. Standard solutions with a pH of 4, 7, and 10 are frequently used. A field test of the pH of a solid that is soluble in water can be determined by placing one part of the solid to five parts of water and measuring the pH. The higher the pH the stronger the base. The lower the pH the stronger the acid. A photoionization detector's ability to detect a chemical depends on its ability to ionize it. The ionization potential, IP, of a chemical to be detected must be less than or equal to the energy generated by the UV lamp. High humidity and radio frequency can interfere with the accuracy of a PID instrument. Four gas meters measure carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and percentages of the lower explosive limit. These meters are frequently used for entry into confined spaces. Single gas meters may be used for specific gases such as chlorine, ammonia, and other analytes. Personal monitoring pumps are worn by workers to ensure that OSHA time-weighted averages are not exceeded during the work week. Calorimetric detector tubes are used to measure specific gases. Detector tubes have reagents that change colors in proportion to the concentration of gas being measured and the volume of gas pulled through the instrument. Lumex meters are portable atomic absorption units that measure mercury in micrograms or nanograms per cubic meter. Meters are available in passive or active vacuum options. Active pump models affords the opportunity to place the instrument outside the contaminated zone and measure the hazardous atmosphere with tubing. Passive meters are frequently slower to respond as they depend on the diffusion of the chemical into the instrument. Instruments need to be calibrated before and after each session of measurements to ensure accuracy. Infrared temperature guns can be used to measure temperatures of containers or releases at a distance to determine if exothermic or potential fire conditions exist. Dissolved oxygen meters are used to measure the concentration of oxygen in water. Oxygen depletion in water can indicate an organic discharge and potential adverse impact to aquatic life. Most DO meters also have a temperature probe that records temperature. Aquatic life cannot tolerate more than a change in pH of more than one or two units. Radiation detectors such as a Geiger counter or cutie pie can be used to identify a potential radiation hazard. Levels exceeding 2 millirems per hour may indicate the need to engage a health physicist. Noise dosimeters reading greater than 85 decibels require earplugs to be worn. Conductivity meters can be used to measure dissolved salts in water. 
conductivities greater than 18 microohms may indicate contamination is present. Section 11 covers medical monitoring. A medical program should begin by selecting response team members that are fit for duty, are able to wear respirators, and are in good physical shape. Periodic monitoring should be conducted based on chemicals that individuals are exposed to and tasks performed on at least an annual basis. For instance, workers exposed to lead may be required to have their blood tested for lead. Medical facilities should be selected that are equipped to handle exposures to hazardous materials handled at your facility or handled according to work tasks performed. Records of exams and treatment need to be maintained according to OSHA and state requirements. Signs of chemical exposures and heat stress need to be monitored on a proactive basis before acute medical conditions occur. Signs of dizziness, headaches, confusion, slurred speech or sweating stops require that workers be taken out of the work task and allowed to rest and rehydrate with water and electrolytes. Selection of proper work periods with frequent hydration and rest periods can avoid adverse health effects when wearing protective gear. Exposures to different hazardous substances present various symptoms. The next couple of slides summarize symptoms for different classes. When working with specific chemicals is it important to know what to look for to avoid adverse health effects. Halogenated aliphatic hydrocarbons target the central nervous system, kidneys, liver and skin. Acute symptoms of exposure include decreased alertness, headaches, and loss of consciousness. Chronic symptoms include swelling around the eyes, anemia, and jaundice. Heavy metals are toxic to the kidneys. Symptoms are generally chronic and include decreased mental ability, weakness, headache, cramps, kidney and brain damage. Medical monitoring should be conducted by occupational medical specialists. Herbicides target kidneys, liver, the central nervous system, and skin. Solvents and herbicides can cause dizziness, headaches, and loss of equilibrium. Chronic effects include tremors, convulsion, and liver damage. Organoclorine insecticides target kidneys, liver, and the central nervous system. Acute effects include convulsions, anemia, irritability, dizziness, and permanent kidney damage. Organophosphate and carbamates insecticides target the central nervous system, liver, and kidneys. Acute symptoms include headache, fatigue, dizziness, increased salivation, and profuse sweating, nausea, vomiting, unconsciousness, and seizures. Chronic effects include permanent nerve damage. Polychlorinated biphenyls target the liver and central nervous system. Health impacts include chloric, liver toxicity, and cancer. One mode of exposure is the ingestion of aquatic species that bioaccumulate PCBs up to 48,000 times. Aromatic hydrocarbons target blood, bone marrow, central nervous system, eyes, respiratory system, skin, liver, and kidneys. Health impacts include CNS depression, decreased alertness, headache, and loss of consciousness. Chronic exposure can cause leukemia. Asbestos targets the lungs and gastrointestinal system. Lung cancer, mesothelioma, asbestosis, and gastrointestinal malignancies can result from chronic exposures. Medical monitoring of entry teams becomes increasingly important when temperatures are above 70 degrees for N heat or less than 32 degrees. Heart rate should not exceed 110 beats per minute during any 30-second rest period. Oral temperatures should not exceed 99.6. Work schedules need to be adjusted according to the parameters referenced on this slide to avoid adverse health impacts. Body water loss should not exceed 1.5% of the total body weight during any single work day. Maintaining good hydration should avoid dehydration. Section 12 covers container and drum handling. This slide presents potential hazardous materials that may be present in different types of drums and materials of construction. Unidentified drums can be very dangerous and should be inspected, sampled, and handled by experts. Special instruments or probes should be used to detect buried drums. Drums which may contain radioactive wastes must not be handled until specially trained personnel can assess the hazards. Lab packs are generally packaged in over packs and may contain hazardous materials. Prior to handling or sampling drums, certain observations should be made prior to initiating a remedial action plan. Are the drums labeled to indicate contents? Are the drums deformed or leaking? Are the drums bulging indicating a potential pressure buildup? Are vapors or mists coming out of the drum indicating that a potential hazardous reaction is occurring? Are the drums rusted or is there any evidence of exterior corrosion or crystallization apparent? 
These observations can assist a competent individual to formulate the appropriate measures that need to be taken. Chokers and drum grabs are used to avoid pinch points to workers when overpacking drums. Telescoping forklifts can reach in and out of confined spaces with hazardous vapors remotely while minimizing exposures. Phosphorus pentoxide is water reactive and unstable. Exothermic reactions can be monitored with an infrared temperature gun. Moisture can be absorbed with oil dry. Moisture was eliminated by overpacking a leaking drum of phosphorus pentoxide and oil dry. Drums can weigh from 400 to 1500 pounds depending on the contents. A minimum of two workers are required to overpack a leaking drum to avoid back strain. Styrene without polymerization inhibitors can react liberating heat exceeding 150 degrees Fahrenheit and cause a container to burst. Styrene contact with metal salts, peroxides or strong acids may also cause polymerization. Polymerization needs to be complete prior to closing an overpack to avoid buildup of pressure. A polymerization inhibitor can also be added to stop the reaction. Avoid curved ends of bulging containers. Choker attachments on a front-end loader or forklift avoids pinch points when overpacking drums. Transferring liquids from damaged totes inside a trailer to a new tote is one method to stop leaks. Cylinders of nitrogen or other compressed gases pose frostbite hazards, oxygen displacement, and frozen valve problems. Once valves are frozen, defrosting of non-flammable gases may be necessary to vent containers. Section 13 covers emergency response references and labeling. Container shapes, materials of construction and colors may suggest potential contents. Spherical or cylindrical containers may contain pressurized liquids or gases. Red containers or labels frequently indicate flammable or combustible materials. Other colors and container materials of construction that may suggest particular contents are depicted on this slide. Emergency response applications are available for cell phones, iPads, and desktop computers. Various app pictograms are illustrated on this slide that can be downloaded. Most fire departments use the DOT Emergency Response Guide or Cameo. Physical chemical properties, OSHA permissible exposure limits, and protective gear recommendations are emphasized in the NIOSH Pocket Guide. The Wiser application gives detailed information that includes odor thresholds, medical and operational response recommendations. EPA's Cameo app contains expanded response operations that is linked to Aloha that plots threat zones for hazardous material releases. NOAA and the Weather app are helpful in tracking weather during a response to provide guidance on the time available to complete a response before weather impacts. Mapping applications include Topo, Google, and other mapping software programs. Sharing photos during recon activities with Solicitor provides GPS, latitude and longitudes to provide visually sharing information on the fate and progress of response efforts with the command center and provides a way of documenting the integrity of response operations. The Wiser application provides a variety of response information that includes protective equipment recommendations, protective distances, clinical signs and symptoms, firefighting procedures, reactivities and incompatibilities, treatment overviews, basic information, properties, hazmat, medical, environment, and acute care procedures for hazmat incidents. EPA's Cameo Emergency Response Database provides reactivity profiles, isolation and evacuation distances, firefighting, non-fire response, protective gear recommendations for DuPont products, personal protective gear recommendations, first aid, physical and chemical properties, acute exposure guidelines for 1, 2, and 3 hazard levels, and circular reportable quantities. Safety data sheets and DOT emergency response guides are also linked.
Access to the Orange Response Guide section of the DOT Emergency Response Guide can be either by the United Nation number in the yellow section or material name in the blue section. Initial isolation and protection distances for chemicals highlighted in green are presented in the back of the guide in Table 1. This slide presents the DOT Guide Navigation Diagram to access response information. Emphasis is placed on explosives, followed by chemicals involved in a fire. Small and large releases also have specific response guidelines. DOT placards and labels indicate the class of material in the container. Response priorities should be placed on identifying materials that pose extreme health and safety hazards that include explosives, reactive oxidizers, or water reactives that have orange, yellow, and blue labels respectively. Flammable materials that are red and indicate a potential fire hazard. Radioactive materials have yellow and white labels. Toxic, poisonous, and corrosive labels are black and white. The associated toxic effect on worker safety is a function of the relative source strength, toxicity, and target organ of the body. DOT hazard classes are indicated in the bottom of the label and are listed below. Class 1 explosives. Class 2 gases. Class 3 flammable liquids. Class 4 flammable solids, spontaneously combustible. Class 5 oxidizers and organic peroxides. Class 6 toxic and infectious materials. Class 7 radioactive. Class 8 Corrosive. Class 9 Miscellaneous Dangerous Goods. The shape of rail cars indicates the general type and relative hazards that may be present. Guide numbers for each car type are indicated on this slide until specific product contents have been identified. This slide illustrates general DOT guide numbers for trailers, intermodal containers, and vacuum tankers until the specific chemical is identified. This slide depicts global harmonized classification labels that are required on all containers that list a signal word hazard statement, precautionary statement, product identifier, and supplier identification. The 10 GHS labels and the associated physical hazards, pictograms and health and environmental hazards, are illustrated on this slide. The NFPA 704 marking system is a system developed by the National Fire Protection Association to alert emergency personnel of the type and degree of hazards within an area, enabling them to more easily decide whether to evacuate the area or to commence control procedures. Blue quadrant, left, indicates health hazard. Red quadrant, top, indicates flammability hazard. Yellow quadrant, right, indicates reactivity hazard. Lower quadrant, bottom, contains symbols indicating special hazards, such as oxy for oxidizers, radioactive trefoil, propeller, W for water reactive materials. A crucial requirement in safely handling hazardous waste is to mark and label containers. Uniformity in marking and labeling containers while the waste is being accumulated to its ultimate disposal is critical. Both the USDOT and US EPA offer specific regulatory guidance, 49 CFR 172, 173, 178 and 179, for hazardous waste generators to follow. It is important to note that these requirements are different from the OSA Hazard Communication Standard, 29 CFR 1910.1200, which offers labeling guidance for hazardous materials that have not been designated as waste. Hazardous waste labeling is divided into two categories non-bulk and bulk packaging. The non-bulk package is defined, 49 CFR 173.115A, as a package which has a maximum capacity of 450 liters, 119 gallons or less as a receptacle for a liquid. A maximum net mass of 400 kilograms, 882 pounds or less, and a maximum capacity of 450 liters, 119 gallons or less as a receptacle for a solid, or a water capacity of 454 kilograms, 1,000 pounds or less as a receptacle for a gas. A bulk package is defined under 49 CFR 171.8 as a packaging, other than a vessel or a barge, including a transport vehicle or freight container, in which hazardous materials are loaded with no intermediate form of containment, and which has 
a maximum capacity greater than 450 liters, 119 gallons, as a receptacle for a liquid. A maximum net mass greater than 400 kilograms, 882 pounds, and a maximum capacity greater than 450 liters, 119 gallons, as a receptacle for a solid, or the water capacity greater than 454 kilograms, 1,000 pounds, as a receptacle for a gas as defined in 173.115 of the subchapter, 49 CFR 173. Safety data sheets are required under OSHA 1910.1200. The role of SDS under the Hazard Communications Standard HCS, is to provide detailed information on each hazardous chemical, including its potential hazardous effects, its physical and chemical characteristics, and recommendations for appropriate protective measures. There are 16 sections provided on SDS sheets. You should be familiar with each section and know where to look for specific information. Section 14 covers spill deployment plans. Fixed facilities should have a spill deployment plan posted on maps in their emergency operations center that depict chemical storage locations, container sizes, odor warning properties, spill kit locations, spill pathways, and containment and recovery points for on-site and off-site migration pathways. Emergency team notification phone numbers and regulatory reporting numbers should also be listed. Evacuation and shelter-in-place locations should also be shown. Worst-case toxic corridor projections for releases should also be shown with evacuation and shelter-in-place radiuses. This slide presents a sample plant drawing with chemical containers, loading racks, emergency operations center, and spill drainage pathways plotted. Radius from the center of the plant are plotted for toxic corridor projection purposes. This chemical inventory table on the next two slides is keyed by number to the previous plant site drawing. Proper chemical names are listed for trade names along with reportable properties, NFPA hazard labels, and other pertinent response information. On-site and off-site containment and recovery points should be posted on an aerial or other map so response staging areas and resources can be directed to the proper location. In the state of Georgia, all spills must be reported regardless of size immediately or within 15 minutes that enter waters of the state. Waters of the state are defined as any pathway or drainage ditch that drains to a creek or river. Spills that are below reportable quantities and contained on site in engineered containment systems do not have to be reported. Section 15 covers spill response, containment, treatment, and recovery methods used for hazardous material spills. Sample spill containment kits are depicted on this slide. Spill kits typically contain sorbent booms, sorbent pads, vinyl river boom, and magnetic drain covers. This slide presents sample point source containment methods for liquids, solids, and gases. Leaks in liquid containers can be stopped using DC or damage control plugs, over packs, rail car pressure discs, transfer kits or membrane covers. Solid releases can be stopped with DC plugs, over packs, membrane covers, transferring product to a good container, or compression plugs. Gas releases can be stopped using chlorop kits for chlorine, midland kits for ammonia, and product transfers to a good container. This slide illustrates application of a chlorop kit to a leaking chlorine rail car, a midland kit to a leaking anhydrous ammonia car, installation of a new pressure disc to a vapor leak on a railcar, and application of a compression clamp to a leaking hopper rail car containing ammonium nitrate. This slide illustrates the transfer of a leaking hypochlorite above ground storage tank to totes and a 1600-gallon poly tanker to facilitate repairs to a defective tank outlet valve. Repair kits containing expansion plugs, gaskets, mechanical plugs, micro cell foam, tennis balls, and epoxy paste are shown in this slide. Pipe mechanical clamps, inflatable plugs, and rubber compression boots are depicted on this slide. Membrane covers can be used to contain vapor and liquid releases from contaminated solids. Contaminated materials need to be covered with plastic under and over materials. Sorbent boom should be placed around the perimeter of the pile to prevent liquid leachates from migrating out of staged materials. 
covers need to be anchored to withstand high winds. Migration containment and pathways for liquids can be achieved using earthen or oil dry dams, inflatable plugs, compression plugs, vacuum boxes, mobile tankers, frack tanks, interceptor trenches or pits, straw filtration dams, swimming pools, temporary impoundments, or stormwater diversion swales. Migration containment for solids can be accomplished with membrane covers or storage in covered roll-off boxes. Gases and particulates can be contained by construction of negative airlocks with HEPA filtration, carbon filtration, or water spray for non-water reactive materials. This slide illustrates application of magnetic drain covers over stormwater drop inlets, straw filtration dams placed at stormwater outfalls, and in streams. This slide illustrates placement of an inflatable plug in a stormwater outfall culvert. Polysorbent booms and pads that reject water and absorb floating insoluble organics can be used for spill containment and recovery in bodies of water. Sorbent booms can be used to prevent oils and hydrocarbons from entering spillways into detention ponds. Booms need to be anchored. Vinyl boom can be used to hurt oils for recovery operations. Oil dry can be broadcast on liquids to immobilize spills. Interceptor pits and lined trenches can be used to stop groundwater migrations in a floating insoluble organics groundwater that is within 8 feet below the land surface. Leaking containers, tankers, or contaminated leachates in streams can be transferred to a good container, temporary holding pond, or tank. A variety of physical chemical treatment techniques exist for lowering or eliminating contaminates that include activated carbon filtration, chemical precipitation, acid or base neutralization, oil water separation, chemical oxidization, aeration, chemical fixation, chemical scrubbing, or other methods listed on this slide. Chemical fixation of a hazardous latex sludge is degasified by the heat of hydration of Portland cement. An acid release on soil is neutralized with soda ash. Pond discharges are filtered by an in-situ granular carbon filtration dam, constructed between two parallel lines of straw bales. Chlorine dioxide liquid waste is dechlorinated with ice and sodium metabisulfite. An ammonia release from a refrigeration system is detoxified by injecting pressurized carbon dioxide. A gasoline release in a wetland is biodegraded with Remtex bioremediation accelerator and water addition. Spill recovery can be performed by transferring liquids into vacuum trucks, tankers, totes or drums. Solids can be excavated and placed in vacuum boxes, vacuum trucks, super sacks, or HEPA vacuums. Vapors can be recovered with mercury vacuums, carbon air filters, cooling or freezing, or chemical scrubbers. This slide illustrates spill containment in a 3,000-gallon bladder, tanker, vacuum box, and vacuum truck. A mobile oil water separator is used to recover transformer oil from a retention pond. A vacuum box is used to recover sludge from a leaking storage tank. Lined or epoxy-coated vacuum boxes can be used to collect wastes that are not compatible with vacuum trucks. Deep and shallow water oil skimmers are used to collect oil from water surfaces. Double-walled frack tanks with containment pools are used to contain hazardous liquids. Vacuum trucks are used to recover coal from railroad ballast. A 4-inch vacuum hose with a jetter nozzle pulled with a cable over rollers is used to remove heavy contaminated sand from a railroad process sewer. Contaminated soils are excavated and loaded in a lined truck for disposal. Contaminated solids are collected with a power broom at a rail yard. After completing this video you are required to take a quiz that follows immediately.